Sí, man. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? 
Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Madam Speaker, to speak your entire house, to speak to your entire house today. Uh, I'm grateful to be selected because among all the rights on our rules, there are obviously um, other colleagues who can equally do this. But he decided to call on me and then I'm grateful for that. So um, I'm streaming on my Facebook page. I just shared the link with you on WhatsApp. I can share with others who are not able to join this session. So you can just do that so that if in case they are not able to join this section, they can at least watch the video. OK. Right Honorable Speaker of the Takradi Technical University Student Parliamentary Council, or in clarity, the Students' Representative Council Parliament. Honorable Members, I'm sure the SRC President as well is here. So Mr. President, Vice President, Executives, as Lordship, the Chief Justice, and all other members of the SRC, and student leaders on campus. I'm John Samega Shibiglu. Uh, for now, my two flagship uh, positions are Speaker of Youth Impact Parliament, Ghana, and then um, the Chairman of National Association of Student Speakers, Ghana. Uh, I'm someone who is passionate about development and due to that, I've set up initiatives to pursue that. Capacity building is very important because if I have not built my capacity, you wouldn't have equally invited me. So capacity building is very important and that is what I also pursue. So I'm happy to come around and educate you all. As a matter of fact, uh, all the things that I'm coming to say are already in my head, so I will just prepare some notes. Uh, Madam Speaker, how many minutes are you giving me for the presentation? Seventeen. So about forty minutes. Okay. I've lined up fifteen items here, but I'll be very brief on them. And please. Yes, the questions keep them coming, okay? Even after this lecture, I, 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 did, uh, I did a lecture in 2022, a very comprehensive one, about a two-hour presentation. So if you want, uh, if in case you are not able to contact me after the lecture, I will share that, that particular recording with Madam Speaker. She will share with you, and then you understand all the things that I'm coming to talk about. So... Yes, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, I'll try and work on the 30 minutes that you have given me. So, ladies and gentlemen, when you hear Parliament, what comes into your mind? A gathering of legislators to make law. But yours is called Parliamentary Council. You're asking, why is it not called Parliament? As a matter of fact, Parliament is just a name. Because if you go to other countries, they call it different names. When you go to Nigeria, they have uh, the National Assembly, it has two chambers, the upper chamber Senate, the, the lower chamber is House of Representatives, and then they, they are state assemblies are called State House of Assemblies. When you go to Kenya, it's called Parliament of Kenya with two chambers. It has the Senate and the National Assembly. When you go to South Africa, it's also a double chamber Parliament of South Africa. The upper house called National Council of Provinces, the lower house called the National Assembly. When you go to the United States, it's called Congress. It's not even called Parliament. It's called Congress with the upper house, 100 seats, called the Senate, from of which two senators are elected from each state. The United States has 50 states. And then they have the lower chamber, the House of Representatives made up of 435 seats elected from congressional districts all around the 50 seats. When you come to the United Kingdom, they also have a two-chamber house, the House of Lords, of which 
the baroness, viscounts, uh, bishops, and lords, and then all of them, former speakers of the House of Commons, are appointed, of which they, they also have the heritage peers and then all those. And then, as of now, there are around 780 lots. That is actually the biggest upper house in the entire of the world. And then the lower house consisting of 650 commons, forming up the House of Commons of the United Kingdom. And then other parliaments, Trinidad and Tobago, for single house or single chamber parliaments, of which we call them the unicameral. Parliament of Ghana, for instance, is a one timber house so it's all about the name because it's all about the name so even for the src's uh, university of uniba calls their own local assembly umat calls their own legislative assembly k university parliamentary council o technical university parliament uh technical university general assembly it's all about the names so Parliamentary Council is not bad. That is the name you have used. So when yours is Parliamentary Council, you shouldn't be calling it General Assembly and then all those, because that is the name you have given to it. So I find it funny when I hear people saying, Speaker of Parliament for the General Assembly. You are using two terminologies. It doesn't add up. It should be Speaker of the General Assembly, not Speaker of Parliament for the General Assembly. Complete misappropriation of the language. Please stop. SRC is like doing that. Now, so if that is the name, what is a single chamber? What is this double chamber? You heard me talking about single chamber, double chamber. So we have a unicameral legislature. Unicameral legislatures are the ones with just one chamber. So all legislative functions are performed by that single house. But when it's a bicameral legislature too, it means all the legislative functions are performed by two houses, an upper chamber and a lower chamber. For Republicans, usually the upper chamber is supervisory and then the lower chamber is basic. So money bills always emanate from the lower chamber. And then they always have different sets of people. They don't have the same people in both. Now, the presiding officer, the person who presides over the sitting, can be called president, can be called speaker can be called chairman, dependent on the terminology that they use. So in Ghana, we have speaker of parliament. The deputies can be one, can be two. When you go to the House of Representatives of the Congress of the Philippines, they have six deputy speakers. Yes. When you go to um, Kenya, they actually have one deputy, but the, the speaker has a speaker's panel. These are other MPs who are appointed to only chair. You know, the deputy speaker absence. But when the speaker and the deputy speaker are on diplomatic missions or they are performing other functions, the speaker's panel, the MPs appointed only preside, but they don't perform the speaker's role in full. It's just that presiding role that they perform. So the dynamics are very wild. The dynamics are very wild. Now, Parliament actually started in the United Kingdom when the king wanted consultation from the, should I say, the upper class. So the king wanted consultation from the upper class, and then he called uh, some few worthy people and very popular people to come around and advise him. That was how come Parliament came about. So the advisory role changed into a legislative role that they were now passing laws on behalf of the king. So that actually brought up the House of Lords currently existing in the United Kingdom. Now, the House of Commons, how did it come about? It came about the commoners were getting annoyed that why is it that it's only the wealthy people and the popular people that are making the laws? Give some of the, 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 the opportunity to we the commoners, we the farmers, we the sellers, we the vendors. And that was how the House of Commons came about, birthing the House of Commons, as you see. So Parliament actually came out as an advisory body before it turned into a legislative function, as you all see. That is the birth of Parliament. And Parliament has been then since the 1300s, over seven or eight generations, not centuries before us. 
So the first parliament in the entire world is still existing now, which is the parliament of the United Kingdom. The parliament of the United Kingdom. So that is it, our the history of parliaments. Parliaments of Ghana actually started as an advisory board to the Governor General of uh, the Gold Coast before our independence. And then it came as National Assembly, then it turned to Parliament, then went to Consultative Assembly before it became Parliament in the Fourth Republic. So Parliament of Ghana actually has been through a lot of systems until 1992 when they adopted only one model. Now, in Ghana, as you know, you have been hearing of governance systems. We have two basic governance systems. We have the parliamentary system and the presidential system. For the parliamentary system, that is where the ultimate authority of the entire country resides in parliament. Parliament is the law. But in the presidential system, the constitution is the supreme law. But in the parliamentary system, the parliament is the supreme law. So, for instance, in the United Kingdom, they practice the parliamentary system. That is the real source of prime ministers. Because the head of state is the monarch, but someone needs to be in charge of governance. Who is the head of government? So the prime ministerial role comes from there. Who is a minister appointed or elected from MPs who is the head of the majority party? So they practice the parliamentary system. But when you go to the United States of America, they practice the presidential system where one person is the head of state and the head of government. The head of state is a ceremonial role. It's just a functional head who takes up the responsibility of being the head. But the person who actually executes the executive power is the head of government. So in the, in the system of the parliamentary system, the role is shared by the head of state and head of government who are different persons. Head of state in most countries, other countries, other than the United Kingdom is the president elected. Like Uganda, they have a head of state and head of government. Museveni is the head of state and their prime minister is the head of government. In UK, King Charles III is the head of state and then the prime minister, Rishki Sunak, is the head of government. So that is where the prime ministerial system came from. Now, in the, in the, in the parliamentary system, the ministers of state are appointed from parliament. But in the presidential system, no minister comes from parliament. No minister comes from parliament. So taking for instance, so taking for instance, apart from the United Kingdom, Kenya practices the presidential system. So none of their ministers called Secretary of State are appointed from parliament. But in Ghana, you see, we don't have a prime minister. The president is both the head of state and head of government. But we have ministers appointed from parliament. That is why in Ghana, we practice the hybrid system. So the hybrid system is a combination of both the presidential and the parliamentary system. That is it for the hybrid system. So in Ghana, we practice the hybrid system. That is why in our constitution, we have it clearly stated that majority of ministers of state ought to be appointed from parliament. It is because of the hybrid system. This, as a matter of fact, weakens the oversight responsibility of parliament. That is for us to note. So, Parliament of Ghana as the legislative arm of our republic, and all laws go to that. Now, Parliament in this state, what is Parliament? Parliament is a body of elected representatives tasked to pass legislation and perform oversight rules on the executive arm of government. That is what Parliament is. The elected representatives are elected from political territories called constituencies. In Ghana, we have 275 constituencies. They are the legitimate elect, uh, political territories to form the representation of parliament. Constituencies in Ghana are different from districts. Districts are administrative breakdowns of executive uh, territories. That is, so districts are headed by the municipal chief executives, district or metropolitan chief executives, not headed by MPs. There can be two constituencies in one district, metropolitan or municipal. But no constituency is supposed to hold two municipals or districts. So that is for us to take. 
So there is no MP that is in charge of a municipal, but a constituency. So Parliament of Ghana, as you know, has a speaker and two deputy speakers. A speaker who is not an MP, even if he was elected as an MP, when he assumes the role of speaker, he ceases to be an MP. And that happened in the case of Right Honorable Edward Doajahu, who was the MP for Avenal constituency. And that was in 2012 when the election happened. Therefore, he ceased to become an MP after his election on the 7th of January, 2013. Now, honorable members, the deputy speakers ought to come not from one party, but from different parties. So we have never had a deputy speaker coming from one party. In the case of the current system, the Formina MP is an independent candidate and that is being seen as not the MPP, although he is working with the MPP. That is how come it looks like two deputy speakers are coming from the MPP. But as a matter of fact, on the matter of law, he is not violating the constitution. But when he tries to now become a full MPP member, he loses the seat as an MP because when you change your party, you desist to be a member of parliament. Now, members of parliament, what is the duty of parliament? Parliament performs deliberative function. Parliament performs financial control. Parliament performs representation or representational function. And Parliament performs lawmaking. Now, the deliberative function is where Parliament deliberates on matters of interest to the country, where views from varying interests and people are shared, and then they deliberate. So Parliament is a talkative. You cannot go to Parliament and say you not talk. Because deliberation is part of your function as an MP. Now, the second one, representation. As you know, every parliamentarian represents constituents. All the people in that constituency are, are called constituents. So every MP is representing a constituent. So when you are there, you are representing your people. You are there for your people, and it was your people that elected you. If it is based on appointment, it is still a constituent because you are representing a particular interest. Taking, for example, when you come to Tanzania, you have people elected from women proportional constituencies. So they are representing women's there. In Kenya, we have people who are representing the disabled community. So there's an MP who must always be disabled to represent that minority group. So there's a representational function in this picture. Now, in our case, apart from our constituents, there is party representation as well. Now, going to the third function, Function, um, financial control. As you know, no money can be spent except approved by parliament. That is why the budget is brought to parliament for approval. And after the approval of the budget, the policies are passed as appropriation bills. Appropriation bills can also be ministerial budgets when budgets are coming from the ministries for parliament to approve. Every loan agreement must be approved by parliament for parliament to perform this financial control. If that is not there, the executive will go and spend more than expected and will fail to account. The oversight role is when parliament ensures that the executive do what they promise to do. The executive says they'll do this. It is parliament that keeps them on their toe to do what they claim they will do. That is why the oversight role is there. That is why ministers of state are invited to answer questions filed by members of parliament. It is clearly the performance of the oversight role. The president reports to parliament to give them a message on the state of the nation. That is also an oversight role being performed by parliament. And parliament deliberates on the motion to thank His Excellency the president for presenting the message on the state of the nation. That is also part of the deliberative or um, that particular oversight rule. And then the last function, as I said, legislation. Parliament passes laws. This is a lawmaking body, the only body allowed to make and make laws. And laws passed by the parliament, as you see, acts of parliament. These are legislations passed by parliament, and they are duly recognized and gazetted after presidential assent. So lawmaking is basic role of parliament. Apart from the constitution, which is the supreme law, parliament makes laws. 
So how are the laws made? They come as bills to parliament, they go through procedures, they are being laid on floor, and after they have been laid, the first reading is done, and then they refer it to a committee. It comes back again for the second reading. They go through the constitution stage, that is amending some provisions of the act uh, of the bill. And after all those are done, it is being read the third time and passed. It's being read the third time and passed before it goes to the president for assent. Now, parliament also has legislative instruments that they pass. Legislative instruments are bylaws coming from um, bodies that have been created by the acts of parliament. So assuming the right to information commission, if they want to pass a bylaw, it has to come to parliament as a legislative instrument for them to pass. Or any other law that parliament wishes to pass, that is not a bill. The constitutional instruments are bylaws that are, that are passed or are brought in by bodies stated by the constitution, the electoral commission, the CI that I hear, constitutional instruments. It is because it is coming from a body recognized by the constitution. So it's missing as a CI that goes through the stages before it is being passed by parliament. Now, the other instrument is the executive instrument. That one does not need parliamentary approval. It comes from part cabinet or the president. For instance, public holidays and state of emergencies are done through executive instruments. So that is something very brief on parliament. Now, I'm talking about positions in parliament of Ghana. So we have the speaker, the first deputy speaker, the second deputy speaker. Now we have the majority leader, the minority leader. Each of them have a deputy, the majority chief whip, and two deputy whips. Administrative, we have the clerk to parliament and two deputy clerks, marshal and deputy marshals. And the parliamentary service, the parliamentary service play administrative role to ensure that parliament is able to perform its duties. Okay, so that parliament performs its duties. Parliament has committees. Standing and select committees. Standing committees stay throughout the lives, and select committees are needed or they perform when they are needed. Mostly they are departmental committees for, say, the Committee on Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, the Committee on Gender, all of them are select committees. But appointments committee, privileges committee are standing committees of parliament. The parliamentary service board is responsible for managing parliament, is chaired by the speaker, and the secretary is the clerk to parliament. These are the so each committee of parliament has a chairman, a vice chairman, a ranking member, and a deputy ranking member. The chairman and vice are mostly coming from the ruling party MPs. The ranking member and deputy ranking member are basically chairmen, but basically coming from the other side of the house, both basically the minority, except some committees that are chaired by the minority. For instance, the public accounts committee has been chaired by the minority. The current chair is the former deputy minority leader, Honorable Dr. James Aveji, the MP for K2 North in the Volta region, is the current chairman of that committee. These are the parliamentary positions. As you know, the current com uh, composition of the eighth parliament of the Republic of Ghana is 137 MPP MPs, 137 NDC MPs, and one in one um, one um, independent member. So that is it for um, the composition of parliament of Ghana. Madam Speaker, I think I'll need more time. I'm trying to be very precise over here, but I think I'll need more time because I can see it's already seven o'clock. So kindly grant me so that I cover all the items very briefly. Now, moving on to matters of interest to you, motions and statements. All the things that I spoke about are things that you know or you should know. They are preliminary to the substantive matter that I'm coming to talk about. As you know, you have been hearing about motions, motions. How the heaven is a motion. Motion is a proposal. A motion is a proposal. Secondment is the succumbing to that proposal or say I am in support of that proposal. A motion will be seconded as not a decision of the House. That is why a motion will be seconded if it is debatable, we say on our members, motion will be seconded is now for the debates of the House or for the consideration of the House. 
after a motion is moved and seconded, a question is put. What is a question? A question at the start is the speaker asking members if they are in conjunction or if they are okay with the motion. That is how the speaker comes. Honorable members, motion will be seconded. I now put the question to the house. All honorable members in favor of the motion say aye. Not in favor, say nay. The eyes have it, the motion carries. Therefore, this house has accordingly accepted this motion. It is because it is a question put to the house. So we have different types of motions. We have procedural motions, we have private motions. We have procedural motions, private motions. Those are the two basic motions of the house. Okay, private motions and procedural motions. Uh, we're hearing something like privileged motions and all those. Those are auxiliary motions. So the procedural motions are motions that are part of the business of the day and they are relevant for business of the day to be done. Private motions are motions that are not exactly part of the business in the sense that it's not coming from parliament itself. Yes, in the sense that it's not coming from parliament itself, but it's coming from an, an MP himself with, with a personal interest, something like that. Those are private motions. Um, yes, but for procedural motions, taking for instance, uh, a motion to adjourn the house is procedural. A motion to adopt the other paper is procedural. A motion to pass the bill is procedural. A motion to accept the budget is procedural because those are motions relevant for business to be done. So how do you move motions? Madam Speaker, I rise to move the motion that this House do accept the budget of the day. That is how you deal with motions. And then if you want to second, if you want to second the motion, Madam Speaker, I rise to second the motion. However, let me say that it is incumbent that you introduce yourself and tell us your portfolio. And tell us your portfolio before you speak. So, Madam Speaker, I'm John Samagas, the member of parliament for this. I rise to nominate the honorable distinct for the office of the deputy speaker. Then someone has to second before it is put for the consideration of the house. That is when it is debatable. Not every motion is debatable. Motions like adjournment are not debatable. We want to adjourn the house. What do you want us to debate about? You want us to do whether or not we are tied or not. It is not debatable. But some motions like motion to accept the budget. You see, before you actually debate a budget, the person reading the budget has to move the motion. And then another person has to second them. And as because of honorable members, motion with a second is now for the consideration of the house. Before you start taking the budget page by page, then after you are done taking it, then when I speak out, put the question on the budget. Yes, unless it is a statement, then you go ahead and then you read what you have, and then members will make comments on it. Mr. Speaker will also give uh, their comments and then you move. But if it is a major decision of the house, it has to come through a motion. However, let us note that a decision can also be made through the ruling of the speaker. The ruling of the speaker is like a president of parliament. It's like a judicial president. It is mostly done to resolve conflicts or matters arising that you should not really use a motion to end it. So the rules of the speaker are final. It's like the verdict of a court. Mind you, the powers of a committee of parliament is equivalent to a high court in Ghana. So you can also give statements. Statements do not need motions. Statements is just an information to the house. You want to inform the house that this has happened, members will share their comments. Now, questions to ministers for SRCs, we don't really have anything like that. But SRC can also invite other uh, office holders of the SRC to question them. So you buy your question, they'll come and answer for you, and then they go. It does not need any motion or anything like that. So that is it for the questions and the motions to the house. Please take note that there are interventional signs. I don't know whether the interventional signs are used in my house to extend to yours, but there are four basic interventional signs. We have the point of contribution. No, let's start with point of information, which is the basic, is just one hand, one finger, 
Then, so points of information is so when you want to inform the house about something, when you want to move a motion, you all use points of contribute, uh, points of information. It's basically um, you want to inform the house about, or it's a new subject matter you want to introduce to on floor. Now, the second one is points of correction. Point of correction is used when you want to correct a fact that has been laid on floor and you feel that is inaccurate and you have the correct one and you want to correct that fact on floor. As you know, the house is a house of records. Therefore, anything being said on floor is being recorded and can so be referred to at any time it needs to be referred to. So in that circumstance, you want to correct that floor. He says, oh, Muhammad was born on 13th of October. And then feel, no. He was born on the 1st of January. You use point of correction. Madam Speaker, I'm John Samagas with Lo. I rise to correct the information laid on floor that Muhammad was born on the 13th of October. Correctly, it was born, he was born on the 1st of January. So that let that, that record be overturned because it is not true. This is the right information. That is how you do points of correction. The next one is points of contribution which is three hands, three fingers. So some houses also do it like this, like you are brushing. It is being used when you want to contribute on the subject matter and the floor. We are all talking about Muhammad's birthday, and then you decide to talk about Kufado's birthday. That is a different subject matter. We are not talking about that. We are talking about Muhammad's birthday. So if you want to talk about Kufado's birthday, you use points of information. But I want to contribute to the same subject matter, which is Muhammad's birthday. You use point of contribution. Then Madam Speaker knows you are coming to contribute to the subject matter on floor and not a different subject matter you want to introduce. So know how to use it so that she can know how best to regulate uh, submissions in the house. Now the last one is point of order. Point of order is when something is being done wrong, someone is out of order, someone is using an unparliamentary language that you want that language being redrawn, or any other matter that you see that is completely out of order and you want to draw the speaker's attention to it. You use point of order. Something is not done well, you feel must be addressed and it's very urgent. You use point of order. As a matter of fact, point of order has the highest precedence, but it is at the discretion of the speaker to call what he or she will feel will aid. Some of you abuse the interventional science, so she will not end up calling you. When some people are abusing the points of order too much, she will not call them. Catching the eye of the speaker depends on your behavior in the house. So if you want Madam Speaker to call you, you have to be of good behavior. Then she will call you. So obviously, we want to uh, approve, and then you are very controversial. She will not call you always. But leaders of the house always catch, catch the eye of the speaker. The leaders of the house are the front benches. They always catch the eye of the speaker. Take note of that. Now, the next item is state of the SRC address. State of the nation's address, as I told you, the president is recommended to always come to parliament at the start of each session of parliament and prior to the dissolution of each house. So the president addresses parliament five times in his term, five times in his term of office. For the SRC, as you know, we refer to a session as a semester. So the SRC president should normally address parliament at the start of each session, which is each semester, and prior to the dissolution of each house. That's the size it should be. So SRC president should address parliament not less than three times. Now, state of the SRC address is basically supposed to be updates that you are giving. What did you do since the last time? What are you going to do? Give us update report. That is how state of the SRC address is supposed to be. The arrangement for state of SRC address, the stage arrangement, you know, the president is in the middle, the speaker is on his left, the chief justice is on his right, and the vice president is on the left of the speaker. That is how the arrangement is supposed to be. Now, sitting arrangements of parliaments, we have opposing benches, we have the arc, we have the semi arc, semi cycle, we have the horseshoe arrangement. All of these are illustrative. I can send the pictures to Madam Speaker for you to see. So, if in parliament, for instance, we always use opposing benches. Some time ago, we tried using the horseshoe. So, Parliament of Ghana is actually using the arc arrangement. 
Parliament of Ghana is using the ARC arrangement. When you go to Kenya, they are using the horseshoe. When you go to USA, they are using the horseshoe. And then all others. When you go to um, the House of Representatives of the United States of America, they are using the semi cycle. They are using the semi cycle because it's basically half a cycle, mm -hmm. but it's in a circular form. And then the normal one that we use, we also have classroom arrangements. So it's left to you try and change the arrangements as time goes on. It makes it very nice and can have that feeling. Ropes, maze, and gavel. The rope is basically um, a garment that the speaker and the clerks wear. So the speaker, deputy speakers, and clerks and deputy clerks are to have ropes. You think about parliament, we have all our ropes, a rope for the speaker, two deputies, clerk, and three deputies. We all have our ropes. I can send the picture to Madam Speaker to send to you to see. It's important that we have the ropes. The ropes basically identifies neutrality. As you know, the speaker is supposed to be neutral on the floor of the house. The speaker does not take interest in debate. So anyone wearing the robe is being perceived that it's neutral. Deputy speakers are supposed to be MPs. Deputy speakers are supposed to be elected from among MPs. But when they are presiding, they are supposed to be neutral. That's why they don't vote when presiding. So deputy speakers can only have robes. The maze is the authority of the heart. In Parliament of Ghana, the maze is always standing upright. In other parliaments, the maze is facing the majority side. It's only Parliament, Parliament of Ghana, and then the Parliament of uh, the National Assembly of South Africa, the maze is standing upright. But apart from that, all other houses, the maze is facing the majority side. Also, the Congress of the Philippines, the maze is also standing upright. So the maze looks like a staff. It's not supposed to be very tall. It should just be four feet, four feet or five feet. The mess is not supposed to be tall. It is mostly golden. And as I said, it signifies the authority of the house. The gavel, the hammer-like thing that the speaker bangs, is the authority of the speaker. It is used to install order in the house. So now members, order. It's used to install order in the house. And then also, basically, it is also used to signify that a decision has been made. So anytime uh, a question is put in the eye service of the next house, the speaker bangs it once. Anytime the speaker rules, bangs it once. But when it, the speaker wants to put order, bangs it three times. That is the gavel. So it's the hammer-like thing. It's called gavel. G-A-R-V-E-L. Gavel. Now I'm getting to the end. The legislature and other arms. What is the relationship? between the legislature and other arms. As you know, the legislature is the lawmaking body. It plays oversight. Other arms are required to be of good behavior and be good friends of the legislature. Because after all, all of you are accounting to the legislature. The entire of Ghana cannot gather as one place to pass laws. The entire of Takrani Technical University students cannot gather as one place to pass law. The meeting will not end today. That is why representatives are elected or appointed. Some of you are hostel presidents, GCR president, association president, and you come there. They are representing your constituents. They are representing your constituents. Some of you are class reps. So that you can take a decision and guide the SLC. So the entire of it, you cannot gather there. Now, if you are not there, the executives will just act haphazardly, and there will be no control by them. They can spend any money they want. That is why you have to be on them to ensure that they truly account for any money that is being given to them. The money is spent judiciously. Now, as you know, um, the ministers of state and judges are being vetted and approved by parliament. It's also a control that parliament has. In the terms of SRC, you know you approve your speaker, chief justice, and appointees of the SRC. It's basically your fund. It's basically your duty. SRC and management. The SRC is supposed to be good friends of management. Because without students, there will be no school to attend. So the SRC is basically a welfare body for all students. That is why all students are part of the SRC. I've drafted the constitution of ATSRC and understand how some of these things go. You need congeniality in all the structures of the SRC. There must be clear definitions of functions to avoid confusion in the system. So your constitution should be clear-cut 
give Glenca's functionality and jurisdiction to all structures to bring that harmonize. And you see, the constitution cannot speak on everything. That is why the SRC parliament is there to pass bylaws to complement the constitution. So if you feel that the constitution makes inadequate provision on this particular structure or this duty, the SRC can draft bylaw and pass it to complement the constitution. I am aware that in Ghana we have for over 1,000 acts of parliament being passed. It's because the constitution cannot contain all of them. That is why parliament has been given the opportunity to pass laws to complement the constitution. But although it's quite sad that after all these 1,000 laws, there are so many loopholes in the laws. So we need to ensure consistency. That is why it says that any law that is not inconsistent with the constitution to the extent of its inconsistency is null and void. It's trying to say that the extent of it contradicting the constitution is null and void. Null and void means not functioning, not legal, not well, cannot work. That is what it means. Leadership aims. The leadership position that we are serving in is to serve people. As King Charles said, this is a call not to be served, but to serve. Most of you, you get there and you think you are, you are privileged and then the people have to serve you. No, you are there to serve them. You are there to serve them and not for you to be served. You should take note of that. Leadership is not easy. You aim for the best. Provide for your people. Leadership is very exhaustive. By the end, it's a privilege to lead people. You are giving direction. So leadership is direction. But leadership without thought, managerial skills leads to catastrophe. So you need to have managerial skills. When you say something, ensure you do it in order for you to have integrity. Because integrity is very important. Say what you do. You are the man of your words. So ensure that what, you have that integrity. And you need to keep on learning. Go for leadership seminars just as this, building your capacity so that you know a lot and do a lot in your leadership post will be very important. Personal development is very important. You should try and read a lot, listen to a lot, listen to more your elders, the former students, the alumni. You have a lot in them. Let them coach you. Some of you have not heard an office before. You don't want to consult people who heard that office before. And then they, you're getting me. So they tell you what. You are trying now, you are trying to see your body. So please try and consult your elders who have been there before. Build your capacity, communication skills. Communication is very important. If you speak and people don't understand you, it's quite a problem. So communication is very important. You should learn the accent that you use, how you speak, articulating, tensing, thinking on faith. I am not reading to you, please. I only prepared what? I only prepared some lines. Everything is in my head. It is because of this something I've been doing for a long time, and I'm just telling you. And I'm flowing because of what? It's a training that I had. So build yourselves. The way you dress, the way you approach people, you need to know the leadership style you want. Because if you are not a good leader, you have issues with your followers. And also note, you cannot satisfy everyone. People will surely talk, whether you like it or not. You are doing good, this guy is too good. You are doing bad, this guy is too bad. People will always talk. That is why you should always stand for the truth and the right thing to be done. The right should not be diluted. Ghana is dying today because the right has been seen as the wrong. Those who stand against corruption, fight against corruption, are being chastised. Why? Because they are seeing corruption as good. All of us are corrupt, but we should control the rate of corruption. Corruption is very bad. And if we don't change this, Ghana will not sail. So I'm calling on all of you to develop your personality. Develop your personality so that you will be good. Um, yes. Now, the last item I want to talk about is the future. The future is for us all. If you want to be president or member of parliament or CEO or whatever in the next future, it starts from now. Build your future by what you are doing now. Those of you who are here have seen the impact of leadership and you know the future you want for yourself. If you are not interested in becoming, you would have been sleeping by now, you would have missed a lot of things that I will see here. So leadership is very important. The future is ours, but the youths are becoming more corrupt than the elderly. Common SRC, how much is in SRC? Just some small 2,000, 5,000, you are destroying yourself, you get in pinch, and then what to spoil your record. How much is in SRC? The money that is at the Republic of Ghana, in fact, what is in SRC is a peanut. Don't destroy yourself because of money over here. Because if you don't carry yourself forward over here, the future will not be given to you. 
you'll be miserable in the future. Go by principles. Stop chasing money and serve the people. The future is ours. Madam Speaker, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. So, as I told you, the main is the authority of the house. It's the gold-like staff that is like four or five inches that is brought in by the marshal. The absence of the maze means the house is not in session or there is no plenary session. When the maze is there, it means the house is sitting. Now, when the maze is standing upright, it means normal business is going on. When the maze is tilted a little bit, it means the rules of the house are relaxed. And when the maze is lying flat facing the president, the seat of the president, it means the highest man of the land is in the house. So for Parliament of Ghana, the maze has three positions. The first one is standing upright. That means business is ongoing. When it's tilted a little bit, it means the rules of the house are relaxed. So when the rules of the house are relaxed, it means some of the standing orders might not work because the rules have been relaxed. The rules is always the last when a foreigner is coming to address the house. Taking, for instance, when Speaker Pelosi, who is Speaker Emerita, of, who was the Speaker of the 166th Congress of the House of Representatives of the United States of America, when she came and she was speaking, the rules had to be relaxed because she is not a minister of state, she is not an MP, therefore has no authority to speak. But in order to hear her, they had to tell the mills a little bit to relax the rules to allow her to speak. When the president of Ghana is in the house, the mills is always lying for So these are the positions of the mills, and this is the meaning. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir.
Okay. So, okay. So, to answer your question, I'll address it. I think Adefano can meet. Okay. So, to address your question, I'll talk about what happens in Parliament of Ghana and how it can relate to yours. In Parliament of Ghana, there are two main caucuses. The biggest party represented in Parliament is called the Majority Caucus. Yeah, so the biggest party represented in parliament forms the majority caucus. They form the majority caucus. So any party with the largest seat or the biggest seat is being, uh, is being given or is being called a majority caucus. Because with just them alone, they form a quorum to actually take a decision of the house. In parliament of Ghana, you need one third of the house to commence business, but you need half of the house to take a decision. So that is why they are called majority caucus because functional, like functionally, they can take a decision on their own. Majority has, or majority takes the way or something like that. And minority caucus is the second biggest party and other parties. The second biggest party and other parties. So should it be that uh, one party, the first party is 180, the second party is 100, and then there are other nine parties they share 1111111212. All of them form the minority caucus, but their leader will come from the second biggest party. So there is only and always going to be only two caucuses in parliament of Ghana. In other parliaments, the majority caucus can be a coalition of two or more parties. Because who knows, in order for that name majority to be vindicated, it means so they can take a decision on their own. So when they don't have that number, they can collate with other smaller parties to become the majority caucus. Uh -huh. You understand? So as you know, they have majority, the deputy majority, the leaders, deputy leaders quits. Now, in your case, as I've been told, you have the whole caucus, the host of caucus, and then is it the class web caucus? Mm, so you have, yes, yeah, appointees. So um, you can't use the term majority and minority in your case because you are not playing party politics over there. But at the end, you see, the caucuses also carry out the understanding that that is a homogeneous group. So the majority party are people with one like interest. The minority caucus is people with one like interest. So in your case, it means the appointees have one like interest, the halls have one like interest, and then the faculties have one like interest. So you should have a leader and a whip. Each of the caucuses you have a caucus leader and caucus whip at least. Maybe a caucus leader, uh, a caucus deputy leader and caucus with just three leaders, each of them. So each of them are supposed to channel the interests of the caucus. None of them should be majority because I'm not sure any of them is above half of the house. Mm -hmm. So that is how they should act. And they will ensure that the wish of the caucus or yeah, the caucus is being perceived. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Please have I answered your question. Sure, I'm a bit of one.
Oh, thank you very much. You see, what happens in TTU is to suit the system. Taking, for instance, in whole technical university, the deputy speakers, there are two groups or two caucuses in whole technical university, SLC parliament. The voting members and the non-voting members. And the deputy speaker is elected from among them. The SRC executives are only members in attendance, so they are ineligible for deputy speakership or leaders of each of the caucus. So for all technical university, the voting caucus or the voting members consist of the faculty coordinators, their secretaries, uh, association presidents, hall presidents, and then all those, and then some religious presidents. So they have the first deputy speaker for them, second deputy speaker comes from you know, voting members, which is the class reps, and then the registered postal members. Mm -hmm. So those are the people who make up that caucus. So if in Takradi Technical University, they are all in agreement that the deputy speaker should be an executive, there is nothing wrong with that. If you want it to be an appointee, there is nothing wrong with that. If you want it to be, um, should I say, postal president whatsoever, there is nothing wrong with it. It's hot you want so far as it is standard so far as it is standard taking for instance when it comes to the house of commons of the united kingdom the deputy speaker must come from a different party of the speaker so so far as you are okay that your deputy speaker must be an executive there's nothing wrong so that he can ensure executive business so there's nothing wrong with that you can change it if you want but the deputy speaker should be an MP. That is the principle. Should be an MP. Mm -hmm. So you can ask all your questions. I'll answer them now. Okay, thank you very much. In answering your question, I'd like to state that you cannot call majority or minority if it's not functional. Because if the whole presence and all those will not be more than half of the house, then then the terminology will just be literal, but it wouldn't be functional. So um, if you feel that both caucuses being merged will signify majority of the house indeed and will be fit the name, sure, try it out. And you elect a leader from one themselves, a deputy leader, and then a queen. And then the appointees will become the minority of the executives. Yes, yeah, so far as the name will be functionable, it's a good idea. But if it's not be functionable, it should stay as how it is. Mm -hmm. 
Oh. Yes, it is possible. It is possible. You can do it. But the only question I'm saying is that let the name reflect in their personality. They should realistic they should realistically be majority in number as well. Because uh -huh. if you add, if you collate them and they are not more than half of the house, then they can let's call hall and this thing corpus. Uh -huh. So you can, you can, it is possible, you can do it. Uh -huh. But at the end, if the number will not add up and the other couples will be more than them, then it's best to just call them their actual name and not majority or minority.
Well, uh, as a matter of fact, majority in Ghana's parliament can be 274, and minority caucus will be one. There is nothing wrong with it. The only thing the speaker has to do is to give the minority a voice. By the end, majority will have their way. That's why we say minority has their say, majority has their way. Minority always just want to be heard. They just want to be heard because they know they can't win the vote. So that is why you protect the interests of them to be heard. They want to just air their view. Because they know, regardless of what they say, majority will do what they want. But they just want to speak. So for the fact that majority might be two times their number does not mean they are being treated unfairly. Just give them an opportunity to be heard and then they'll be okay. Because it's the minority group. They are never going to take the day until things happen and then majority decides to join them. They are never going to take the day. Oh, feel free and ask your questions. Um, thank you very much for this question. I have a personal view on this. I am of the view that SRCs should not use majority and minority because the interest of SRC is student accountability. So when you have majority, it's going to look like the majority caucus will always be for the executives to do their malicious things. But when the caucus is unidentified by that, you will not have any natural cunning for them to accept whatever the executives would want or accept whatever that will come on floor. They will act by their instinct and act by what their constituents say. But if you have that phrase, majority or minority, the majority will be forced to, like, psychologically, they will feel like they must append to what the executives do or succumb to what they do, regardless of, you know what is happening in Parliament of Ghana, regardless of how bad the executive business is, because they are part of the ruling party, as a majority caucus, they succumb to it until they get so tired in the case of the vote of censure on the Minister of Information that uh, 90 of majority MPs came out to end their view that no, it is wrong and the guy should go, but they just don't succumb to the way minority is going about it. But in majority of the cases, they succumb to whatever the ruling party brings. And I'm not sure that this whole student governance should be encouraging. We want accountability. And in order to have accountability, we should be independent of our minds. The host of presidents who feel the SRC president is doing wrong should help him account. He should account, not to bid for whatever he brings on floor of parliament. So I am of the view that student parliaments should stick to their individuality. If they will come with caucuses, it shouldn't be majority or minority. But in the case of we, the youth parliaments, we are trying to mimic what happens in parliaments of Ghana. So we create the majority and minority caucus and share the numbers that majority always have more numbers, but we don't add politicking. We don't add political parties to it. Just for us to have, we want to have the sensation of how it feels like to always be concurring to executive business and executive will. So that before we get to Parliament of Ghana, we know how it feels that we are not coming to now go to or go for another training again. So for the youth parliament concept, which is purely capacity building, majority and minority caucuses are relevant. But in the situation of student parliaments, no. You should aim at executives accounting for whatever person they have taken, whatever promise that they have given to the house. So members should be independent of their thought. And I think the caucuses you have are okay, and they are better off than having calling it majority or minority caucus. Thank you.
Uh, I second it. I want to chip in for just one thing. I'm bidding for one of my members. Please, on, uh, the person you call Honorable Annabelle Nubaki, she's not Honorable. She's the right Honorable for the records. So please, she's the right Honorable. Let's address that. Don't call her Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker. Thank you. Because it's not a little bit more. 